also want to uh, qualify some of what I'm going to say today. Uh, first off, I want to acknowledge that we're here uh, on the, the land of the Duwamish, the unceded land. For anybody who will be watching or listening to a recording and can't see this, I'm an older white dude standing in a nice office looking out at the water. And I'll be talking to some slides, so if you can't see them, hopefully my explanation will help. Uh, I also acknowledge that uh, there's other people we'd love to have at the table. We, there's other people we'd love to have present. Uh, we did do reach outs to people from underrepresented groups who are doing wonderful work in XR. Uh, for various reasons, they were unable to join us today. But as we keep moving forward with this programming, we will definitely make sure that we are uh, mixing it up as to who is uh, presenting and who is a part of the, the big mix. So yes. thank you. And thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Heather, for, for hosting. Yes. And if anybody doesn't know where we are, can you tell everybody where we're at? Because Hi, everyone. I'm Heather. I work here at Long Duty. Uh, we're an agency working with Fortune 500 companies. We're owned by Emphasis, which is one of the larger tech firms in the world, 320,000 employees worldwide. And yes, we have a decent view if you want to take a look, if you haven't. And also, if you can't see back there, let me know, and I can pull the blinds down, too. Like, I don't, if the glare is really bad, let me know. <coughs> but I, I didn't want to, like, you know, obstruct the view. <laughs> anyway, we're really excited to have Daniel here today. Awesome. And if Kevin didn't say it, I'm a designer, and, you know, when I'm telling people what a designer means, it means uh, I don't code. So it's, it's, a, it's all the knots. <laughs> it's, it's a, I don't code, I don't do marketing, I don't sell anything. So what do I do? I help try to figure out what an app or an experience uh, should do uh, in that there's lots of different components of that some of that I'll get into yeah, so when I say so you want to design immersive app I really mean design I'm not talking about how do you code it I'm not talking about how you sell it or market it I'm really going to talk about UI design uh, and I hope that is relevant to what you're all up to Ooh, it actually works so first I'll talk a little bit about myself so you know who I am uh, that's me. I've always been a builder and a maker. What you're seeing in this tableau is G.I. Joe is uh, climbing up this this uh, construction I made out of a tripod. Interesting, I, I brought a tripod today, but that's just coincidence. But always been making things. Uh, this is a project I did, gosh, probably 11 years ago or something like that. This is a modular laser cut dollhouse I made. Uh, interesting thing about this, it had three modes of play. Uh, one is you could just treat it like a dollhouse and play with it, and others you could rearrange the rooms, and another you could actually build the rooms from sort of IKEA flat pack type stuff. Uh, fun project, I never productized it, because for me it's about the making of stuff in the first place. Sometimes I make bigger things. Uh, Kevin helped me with this. This is a art car I did about 12 years, 11, 12 years ago, 12 years ago. For, for Burning Man. Uh, it's meant to, if you squint in your eyes, it's kind of meant to look like the top of a submarine with the rest of the submarine under the, the sand. You can debate whether it evokes that or not. And on the inside, of course, was a massage studio. Uh, so Kevin and a bunch of us built it. I would consider that to be my midlife uh, crisis project. Uh, I recommend if you do have a midlife crisis that you make it constructive as opposed to destructive. Did you burn it afterwards? No, <laughs> but it, it rotted and eventually got towed and that's a whole other story. Uh, I've, been, I've been super fortunate in my life. I don't like to say lucky because uh, luck implies that it somehow came from externally, but I've been very fortunate uh, to be in very good company in my journey uh, both educationally and, and professionally. Uh, you know, I worked for eight years in a research group at Brown on computer graphics, and that was where I first got introduced to virtual reality. I'll show you an image of what that looked like in the early days. I spent way too long at Microsoft, mostly on the research side, uh, trying to figure out basic 3D interaction techniques. Uh, never figured it out. And a very short stint at a consult local consultancy where I learned I'm not a good consultant. I uh, <laughs> spent a year at a startup working on VR for architects, and I, I loved that until we ran out of money. Uh, spent about three years at HTC, who's a Taiwanese company that makes VR and AR hardware. Spent about a year and a half at Meta working on social VR, uh, and I will talk about that and show some of that work. And now I'm at Adobe up in Fremont, where I'm a, a principal designer working across all of our 3D AR VR uh, offerings and apps and projects. And my current project, which I can't show you anything, uh, is about bringing generative AI into the 3D space. And uh, that's the new hotness, and it's Pretty cool stuff, but there's also a lot of nuance and, and issues around it. So, photographic evidence this is probably around 1992 or something like that. 
Uh, you can tell from the, the sort of late 80s clothing and the, the mullet, and uh, this is a, an early VR device called a fake space boom. Uh, it, was, it was grayscale. Uh, it was very high resolution, but it was very limited, and that probably cost about a quarter of a million dollars, and it was hooked up to a machine called an SGI, which was about another quarter of a million dollars. So things have evolved quite a bit. Uh, but maybe they haven't. Uh, this is me just a few years ago using a prototype augmented reality device. Uh, so you could argue maybe we haven't come that far, uh, but still trying to figure out what we can do with these things. So let me jump in. Uh, enough about me. Let's get into the actual design principles of doing this kind of work around, uh, we say so many terms, XR is sort of the agglomeration of AR, VR, uh, pass-through of AR, you know, when you see the new Apple device, uh, in some sense it's an augmented reality device, but it's really doing pass-through because it's using high-res cameras. Uh, but a lot of these principles really hold. And one of the first ones that I've encountered every time, every time we try to make these things is the real world is much messier than we as designers want it to be. Uh, this is a photo I took when I was embedded in an architecture firm working on VR, and the first thing you should notice, well, actually I should ask you, what are some of the things you notice in this picture? Just shout it out. What, what do you notice? Let's do some ethnography. Hmm? Yeah, paper. Uh, what else? Not enough space. Yeah, not enough space. She's got two monitors, which is which is interesting. Uh, it's a pretty small physical space. She's got a lot of things around there. She's got some ambient uh, information stuff as well. Uh, and she's got, well, this is before the pandemic, so there's other people around here as well. Uh, but you'll notice that she is really bringing in information and adding information in multiple modalities. And you can imagine, you put one of these things on, that becomes a lot harder. Uh, case in point, this is uh, something that we used to do in the past before the mm -hmm. pandemic called a meeting, uh, an in-person <laughs> meeting. And this is actually a very, very expensive meeting because all these people are principals at this architecture firm. And one thing you'll notice is that dude over there, he's actually got a little early headset on. And you say, cool, that's a win, he's using the tech. But as soon as you put that thing on, he's effectively not part of the meeting. And he's not, he's not aware of all the, the nonverbal cues that are happening and all the interactions. So I'm sort of setting this up to say it's hard to do this stuff and it's, it's a lot different than doing things on a mobile device or on a, on a desktop computer or even a, an audio device. Uh, keep that in mind. Okay, here's the cheat sheet. You can just take a picture of this and then you're all free to go. Uh, these are all the principles right here. But uh, I, will, I will walk through these, uh, a bunch of these, not all of them. Uh, if there's any two that you should pay the most, most attention to, and this is of course common across all apps and all modalities, but is very, very important in, in XR design, is managing the user's attention. Uh, we can make bigger computers, faster computers, uh, they'll last longer, do all the higher resolution. But we haven't yet figured out how to hack human attention and give people more attention than they already have. If anything, you could argue it's decreasing. Uh, next one is being able to respect social needs and conventions. This becomes super important in VR uh, because you know, you're cutting out the real world. Sometimes you're interacting with other people in a virtual space who may or may not look like themselves, who may not even be who you think they are, but still are very embodied. And when people are interacting with you in their bodies, uh, that can be a very strange thing. I also want to step back and acknowledge that it's very weird that I'm talking about immersive design, but I'm just showing you a freaking PowerPoint. So just running on. I wish we could all be in headset right now, uh, but I can tell you that would take a long time to get everybody set up and logged in and all that other stuff. But uh, I, I invite you on your own to do this kind of stuff. So let's jump in. So I talked about respecting social needs and conventions. Uh, this is just a quick mock-up of showing different ways that people might be in a space. So imagine that we're all looking at something together. We can be around it or it can be next to each other. What does that mean when we're in different physical configurations? Uh, you know, maybe we fit better in the space when we're around something, but then how do we all have the same view of, of, of something if we're trying to have shared understanding? Uh, in the real world, we negotiate space, but what does it mean in a virtual world where I can walk through you? Uh, does that make people uh, uncomfortable? Uh, so here's an example. So, drunk and sip, if you're if you're fully wanting to like completely get yeah, rid of that, I want, I want the yes, please. John needs nuts. Okay, oh. it's, it's not something away. you're gonna have in in like every every venues. No, it just shows up in this one. <laughs> So I recorded, I recorded that yesterday uh, in a, a social VR app called Harassing Worlds, which I worked on. I don't work on it anymore, but I do go in occasionally. And there's a bunch of things you should have noticed in that. Um, one, you saw somebody just going round and round and round. That was very disruptive. Uh, should we have a system where I can hit a button and then teleport it out there? You know, there's a lot of nuance around that. 
Uh, if you heard the audio, what was happening is a guy was complaining to the community guide, who's effectively an employee, about a piece of UI that was in his face that he didn't want there anymore. Uh, so she's having to take time out of her job to help him figure out, and she was describing, hit this button, hit this button, hit this button to make this thing go away. And the thing is, because I know the system, she couldn't actually see his control panel when he opened it up. So there's a lot of puppeteering that happens. Whereas if I, I don't have a phone on me here, but if I picked up a phone and was trying to describe something, we, it's much easier for me to, to point and describe, and it's lower cost. But in VR, when I pop up a big display, nobody else knows what I'm doing. What if the soap no, stand? No, what if the soap stand? No, we need the soap stand. We need fire. Ah, so I hit the safety button, and what it did is it just paused the world, or effectively paused it. Uh, it froze everything, and you think, oh, this is, this is a good way to get to a safe situation. But there are some disconnects here. When you come out of that, the world may have changed. And also, when you do that, you're kind of frozen. Everybody else is moving around. They can come behind you, put their fingers behind your head, it's, you know, teabag you, whatever they want to. <laughs> These are things, you know, one have to, has to be aware of in, in immersive design. And again, I recorded this yesterday. Uh, and this is just going in for 10 seconds, you know, that, that this kind of stuff was happening. Uh, you'll notice a lot of different ways that interfaces show up in, in XR, and, and I'm going to bias toward VR because it's a lot easier to talk about. Uh, and there's actually more degrees of freedom in VR than AR. So there's a bunch of different ways that we can show interface panels, and I'll quickly run through them. Uh, one is we can have things in world space where they're sort of attached to the world. Another is they're attached to our body as we move around. Uh, not our head, but our body. Uh, they could be attached to our head, like head-up display, and they can be attached to our wrist. So that, that's a little abstract. Let me uh, show you what that actually looks like. This is, again, Horizon Worlds. So there's a wrist lock UI that's on my hand. Now I've got a body locked piece of UI. So as I move around the world, it moves with me, but not attached to my head. So I can look around and I see different things, but it's always sort of floating near me. So what I'm presenting here, what I'm setting up is all the degrees of freedom that you have to think about that you don't have to think about on desktop and mobile. This is world locked, but I can still move around it. So you see that control panel is attached to the world. I move around, it stays in a, in a stable location. Uh, there's pros and minuses to, to all of these. And then now, uh, this is world locked, but my navigation is disabled. So I can't move around. I can move my head, but I can't actually walk around or teleport. Uh, here you'll, you'll see a proximity activated panel. So as I get near it, it opens up, closes away. And there's a headlock panel. That's actually the one that that guy was complaining about, because everywhere you go, it's there in your face. Now, you might think it's super efficient. It's always off to the side. It's kind of like when you're in a jet fighter and you have a head-up display. Uh, the problem with VR is it actually is a little nauseating to have these things, and it also obscures a lot of things that you care about in the world. So I would predict that in a month I, that panel is not there anymore. So we'll see. Hand-to-hand uh, -hand interactions. This is a, a subtle one. Uh, think about if you've got a, a device like this, uh, and I'm trying to do something with it. Now, that's pretty easy to do in the real world because I can feel it. The buttons all have a, a feeling. I don't even have to look at it to some degree. If anybody remembers T9, how you could do stuff without looking. But in VR, where we don't have that haptic feedback, it becomes much trickier. And what you'll see in this little clip is on my left hand, I have a slider. And on my right hand, I have a, a laser beam cursor. And I'm trying to manipulate that. But the problem is that my hands, you know, they move around, they jitter a little bit, just as a normal human being. And it's really hard to get those hit targets and get precision. So I would say that that was a negative example, something to avoid if you can, to, to have targets that you're trying to get that are moving around. If you need to do fine-grained interaction, anything more than just a momentary press, that should be a, a locked panel uh, or some other mechanism. We want to talk about scale also. Uh, this is something we're very good at dealing with scale in mobile and desktop. You know, we, we know all the parameters of type and, and layout, and we know it works and different DPI and stuff like that. In VR, it's a whole different ball of wax. So, you know, imagine I design this little tile interface and I can, I can see my thing and it looks fine. Like, oh, great demo. Now what if I have 100 of these? Now I have to like get a lot closer. And the problem is as I get closer to see these, I've lost my control panel, which was down at the bottom. So there's this negotiation between density and where things are. Uh, often in VR, we want to show less so that we have, uh, it's easy to, to see things and hit them and get to them. Occlusion, this, this doesn't really come up also in, in traditional design. Uh, so here, I want to go change this piece of text. And the keyboard popped up, but it's, it's being intersected with this avatar. So now I'm going to have to do a secondary mechanical interaction to move the keyboard out of the way 
of that object so that I can enter the type. And oh, I can't see it if I get closer. If I get close enough to see the keyboard, then maybe I can't even see the target of the text I'm entering. These are the kinds of things, again, you have to, to, to battle with. Uh, any, anybody have any ideas of how you could solve this? Voice. Yep. That's yeah. one, okay. What, what are some other ideas? Well, I mean, the text at the top doesn't need to be locked at the top of somebody's head, does it? I mean, you have a little bit of a menu here, but I mean, it could be below or on the side. Yeah. Yeah, another thing that you'll sometimes see is, uh, and this is a, a rendering trick with having to do with how you render things is, this could be in the 3D scene, but we guarantee that, that it's always drawn after everything else, uh, which means that nothing includes it. The problem though is that can cause a headache because you, you've got a sort of a Z fight, uh, sort of you're crossing the signals that the brain is getting and that this object appears to be at one distance, but then it's actually shown in front of other things. Uh, it's a subtle thing, uh, a lot of apps do that, but it does create uh, some confusion for the perceptual system. Another thing that often happens in these kinds of systems, again, VR, not AR, hopefully you're not getting lost in the real world as much, but in VR, it's very easy to get lost. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. One, a lot of the designs that people make don't have enough cues for wayfinding. If you're in the real world, now moving around here, there's actually a ton of detail. You know, it's fairly repetitive in here, but there is a lot of things. I've got vertical lines, I've got texture in the floor, I've got these things on the ceiling. All of these are helping me always do wayfinding. But if I go into a very abstract environment and I'm not familiar with how to, to move myself around it, boom, I'm lost, I don't know where I am. So it's key, it's absolutely key that there has to be a big red button that says, get me back to a comfortable space. Uh, the tension there, of course, is if you move someone, imagine you're on a little tram car and I move you from one place to another, if I take your body, that also can create nausea, uh, you know, make you wanna throw up if I just take your body. And that's because there's a conflict at that point between the vestibular system, which is you know, the little uh, thing in your ear that tells you which way is up, and the visual system, what's happening. So it's actually better sometimes to just black things out uh, and then take you somewhere else and then bring the world back. Uh, so we, we call that you know, giving things out, bringing it back. You know, subtle design things. Uh, again, things that don't happen on, on desktop or, or mobile. Typing, uh, as we talked very briefly, this is a super pain in the butt. This will illustrate just how painful this can be. So here I'm trying to enter something. And what I've got is it's a, we call this a drumstick interface. So on the end of my uh, pointers, I've got a little dot and I'm sort of going like this in VR, trying to hit these tiny little targets. It did some things right. This is world locked right now. Uh, and I can't really locomote, so I don't have any hand-eye coordination issues, but it's still hard to hit those targets. And it's, it's really cumbersome to do that and exhausting. Uh, also, you know, you're typically holding your hands up like this, which can be tiring. So these are big unsolved things you have to deal with. Uh, the biggest suggestion I would say is don't require typing. Uh, and, they, and they did an interesting thing. When you create one of these new uh, worlds here, they actually give you a made up title. So I could just accept that uh, if, I, if I wanted to. But dictation is a good way to do things as well. Another thing we, we tend to think about on desktop and, mo and mobile is we, we kind of have a, a you know, uh, we're, we don't like doing modal interfaces. They, we, we feel like we're doing things wrong if something is modal. We feel like, what's the problem? Why are there different modes? And why are we forcing it on the user? In VR, there's actually, it flipped. Uh, it's actually kind of comforting to have modals sometimes. So uh, I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna edit my avatar. And as soon as I do that, I actually get a modal interface and I can't do anything else at this point. I can't locomote, I can't navigate around the world. And this makes it much easier to hit certain targets and make sure that the UI is aligned to me, I don't lose it, uh, I get to undraw certain parts of the world, so there's a lot of good reasons to do modality. Uh, I talked a little bit about precise hand coordination. This will show you a more detailed uh, issue with that. So what I'm trying to do right now is select a bunch of objects. And if you've been in something like Photoshop or any drawing program or even trying to select text on a phone, that can be pretty hard. Now trying to imagine doing it in VR where you have ungrounded interaction. Ungrounded means that I don't have any precise surface to move on. I don't have a mouse on a desk. I don't have a finger on a surface. I'm just moving my hand through, free, through space, hoping that the visual feedback I get is enough to inform me as to what's happening. And you'll, you'll see there again, see, let me replay that. What's actually happening is, so I try really carefully to, to wave my hand through space and select all these objects. And I think I have them all. 
and then I grab one of these gizmos, this, those are the handles that I used to, to move something, and I notice, oh, I actually left one object behind, so I didn't get everything. Uh, that's a very costly interaction when, when people don't get the selection they want to, and again, it's very hard to do this in VR. Anybody have any clever ideas of how we could have solved something like this? What, what do you mean? Can you just like select all, all the things on that model? Well, they're not, there's no relationship among them right now. Right now they're just objects floating in space. It's, think of this as a drawing program. Can they be grouped like in a drawing program? But to group them, you first have to select them, and that, that's exactly Can the task. Can you import them? Like do it on your computer and import them? <laughs> Maybe. And there where you can just draw a circle around them and select a lasso. So, like but, a then, lasso. but then what happens in 3D? So imagine it's a yeah. volume. When I do that, am I getting every object behind, behind it? it? Uh, yeah. And what kind of feedback should I get? Should mm -hmm. I give you as you're doing that selection? And in this app, actually, it has something like five different selection modes. Mm -hmm. One is a a, rect a a cube, a cubic volume, so you can draw it, drag out a cube, which is sort of like a, a 3D version of the, the standard bounding box. It has a spherical selection, it has a linear selection, and then it has this, has this freeform line-based selection. Uh, but just that they have all those different techniques, to me, indicates that there's a, a lot of area for improvement mm -hmm. right there. Uh, I think about things like, uh, how could you do kind of a, an organic grow from here selection? So imagine I, I, I went to one locus of interest and I press and held a button, and maybe the selection started growing you know, from it, uh, you know, using some frequency analysis to figure out where the stuff is, because you want to probably get more detailed stuff rather than larger things, because larger things you don't need help selecting. You know, that could be one kind of idea. Any anyway, guys, stuff to deal with. Uh, and then very related to that is, uh, you know, how big should things be when you're trying to select them? And part of the problem in VR is because you can change scale all the time. Not only can you move around the world, I don't know if you saw, but I can be the size of an ant, I can be the size of a giant or a god. As I'm doing that, it, it becomes really hard to modify the precision of selection. So I'll give you an example here. So, you know, I'm selecting these objects using this sort of drag path, and now I'm trying to grab one of the handles of the manipulator, and I don't know if you can see, but the, the feedback on that controller is changing rapidly, indicating that it doesn't even know what I'm trying to do as I'm moving. And I'm moving that controller just to, I'll show it one more time, I'm moving that controller just a tiny bit back and forth. And, it's, and these things are just wildly changing what they're doing because it's got different objects under the cursor. And I'm not even quite sure which is the cursor. Is it the end of this little blue arrow? Is it the centroid of the arrow? Uh, you know, again, lots of opportunities where you gotta help people with, with feedback as to what they're doing. Now I'm going to talk about some real world examples that I've worked on. So I sort of set this up with, here's all the hard stuff. Uh, let's talk about some examples. Some of these address some of these, some don't, but these are, are real applications that I've actually worked on. So this is a demo video from the startup I worked at. Let me just pause this for a second to set this up. Uh, again, this was in 2016, 17. This is the age of Google Cardboard, which if you maybe remember were phone-based VR where you put it up to your face, uh, either in a holder or just as it is. Uh, that was before headsets were, were uh, widely available, even if not widely used. Uh, in this particular application, what's happening is everybody is synchronizing their device together. They're getting a, a signal actually through their phone, a sub-audio signal that all the phones are getting. And people are then going to hold this up to their face, uh, either in a, in a holder or just monocular uh, at a more comfortable distance. And they're going to annotate the environment. And they're going to see historical views of the environment, something that might be useful to architects. And as you're watching this, uh, and here's just a standard mobile app where I'm just opening a project. Say, yeah, I want to go into this thing and go into the meeting. And I'm using the device to, to annotate, to draw. I've got this little cursor that I can, that's in the center of my view. I can move around and select things. I'm seeing a historical view. Maybe I'm getting instructions about how to interact with the physical environment. And again, this is 2016, 2017 feels very primitive at this point. But this is phone-based VR. 
and this is showing, showing, showing synchronized. So there are a bunch of things to pull out there. So what I'd love you, for you to do is to use that lens, that cheat sheet of all those different principles that, that one should uh, apply when they're doing this and say, how did this stack up? Uh, I'm not going to show the video again, but I'll describe some of the elements in it where we were trying to address that. First off is there was, because we didn't have controllers, you know, there was no sensing controllers, we only had one cursor, which was the center of your view, which actually turned out to be an advantage because it was very unambiguous as to where selection was. Uh, we also had very limited menus. Uh, you know, I think every week we made the app even simpler and simpler and pulled things out, uh, which meant that it was very unambiguous as to what to, what to select. Uh, at first, we did a lot of the UI where we had dwell time, which means you hold your view on something and then you wait and then something happens. Uh, it turns out that's not a good interaction because you know we move around a lot and it's exhausting. So then we tried to add you know sort of a, a positive button to, to select things uh, in addition to that. Uh, you know th these are things to balance. How do how do I go about designing something like this? Uh, you know, I still start on paper a lot of the time, or whiteboard, uh, if, if I'm being a good designer. You know, sketching is very valuable. And then there's lots of ways to develop past this. Sometimes I need to do something that's, that's pretty involved. So I did this in a VR-based animation tool to illustrate an app that I wanted a, a certain company to make. And this is all a pass through AR. Two people interacting around a shared object, but they diff have different views. Now I've moved one of the virtual people, so we're side by side. Again, respecting the sort of the social interactions between people. But something like that takes a long time to make, and it's linear media. And then if someone says, you know, make it blue, then you have to go and change it. So it's it's often very uh, useful even to do much much simpler things. Here's a quick UI design I did. This is I'm going to confess this is done in PowerPoint. You know. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is probably, I don't know, 2018 or something like that. Uh, use whatever tool will help you get the design done fastest. And this is just showing different selections using selection techniques using the hand. Mm -hmm. And also because it's so abstract, I'm getting people to focus on the right things, which are the interaction, not on the colors and you know, all the other aspects of it. Uh, but compare that to the, the previous example. So I showed you a continuum. I showed you sketch, you know, paper where uh, sketching is fun, it's fast, but you can also do a lot of line with a sketch or, or on a whiteboard. You know, they're infinite resolution, you get to decide what's abstract, what's not. There's no motion in it, of course, uh, and then you also get to fudge a lot on scale. Uh, I can't tell you how many designs I've seen where someone does some amazing VR you know, music player, and they show, say, three albums. And it's like, oh, that's great, but how about if I have 10,000 you know, things? So always be thinking about scale. So, I've showed you sketch, I showed you that pretty high production value uh, VR-based animation with the two people, and then I show you this craptastic thing in, in PowerPoint, but just meant to, to show an interaction. And then there's, there's other kind of crappy ways you can illustrate an interaction. This might have been done in Figma or XD, I don't even remember, but the point again is not the fidelity, the point is to tell a story. Uh, you know, it should be very obvious what someone's trying to do in this augmented reality interface, that they're using their, you know, one finger across their hand to do different selection techniques. Uh, and then, of course, the next step after this, before you go to code, before you do anything with it, is uh, try to get prototypes up really quickly. So here's a prototype that a developer did, and you'll see the combination of some of these techniques together. So this is in Unity, and this is with a pass-through AR device and they're, they're trying this out. So the, the device is actually sensing where their hand is, it's sensing, you know, uh, it's, it's what it, I'm gonna ask you, what technique is this? Is this wrist locked, is this world locked, is it body locked, any guesses? I think it's world locked. Yep, pretty much, yeah. Though it's world locked with a, swipe, a slight qualifier, which is that it has lazy follow on it, which means that uh, let's pretend this is the interface and it pops up. So as I move my hand around, it's fairly stable. But if I move past a certain threshold, then it catches up to where I am. And that's a technique we often do in, in uh, XR design. Uh, again, call that kind of thing lazy follow or, or catch up. Uh, we think a lot about thresholds. You know, if I'm paying attention here, maybe hide things. But if I move, then show me things that help me understand how I'm moving. Uh, how do I use those different degrees of freedom and the different information that you don't even care about on, on mobile or, or desktop. 
Most important step, though, of course, is validate, validate, and do user studies. These are some slides where, uh, from a presentation a great user researcher did where they took those mock-ups and the simple prototypes, put them in front of users, and this is, again, before the pandemic, we had people physically come in and try this stuff. Uh, and it was, it's really humbling to go through one of these things. Uh, some of the best advice I ever got was from Randy Pausch, the, the late Randy Pausch, who did a lot of great work around uh, you know, immersive design and teaching. And he said, you know, when you had people do user studies and he had the designer or the developer in the room, he made them always have their, their hands under their butt. Uh, because the first impulse, of course, is when you see people getting stuck is to say, oh, you know, do this. And, and he would actually, I think he made people pay if they interrupted the, the user. Um, and then if, you, if they got totally, totally stuck, the, uh, the designer or the developer had to humbly raise their hand and say, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm such a bad designer, man, I'll show you how to, to get past this point. Uh, but those moments happen when you're doing these studies and there's always surprises. And uh, you know, I miss being able to do a lot of this in-person stuff. I hope we'll, we'll get back to that. Uh, but it, but it's, uh, it's absolutely, valuable and as I showed you from that image of going to the architecture firm and, and Kevin can back me up this uh, when you go to someone's workplace whether that be at their home these days or in a, in a physical place you see a lot of things that you wouldn't get through a survey you see a lot of things you wouldn't get through a questionnaire you see a lot of things that you might not even get just just filming something you, you get to hear about uh, sort of implicitly how do people arrange their space how do people not talk about certain things it's the, the words between the words you know, I might say, I have this best design for how to do a volume slider with my finger on my thumb, but then you go into the physical environment and you see someone's trying to get on the bus and they're carrying two bags, well now they can't even do that technique at all and it causes you to, to reevaluate. So I invite you to all be amateur ethnographers, Kevin can back me up on that, right? invaluable stuff. Uh, there's great ways to do that. A completely different app here now. Um, these are again 3D sketches, this is all, these sketches were made in VR. But uh, this is a, an avatar editor that I, that I mocked up. An avatar editor is how do you change your appearance in 3D? Um, there's different vectors. Some is you know, your body and your face and all that. Others are clothing. Uh, but the reason I'm showing this, this is I'm talking about the design process and how we bring these principles in. So I'm going to blast through these, a bunch of different designs. I don't think any of them are particularly good, but the point is doing these in a very quick amount of time to just expand the space and see, you know, what does it look? What's it like if I have essentially a traditional scrolling interface, but in VR? How do I multiplex the space? Uh, you know, maybe if I look from one angle, I see some metadata, and if I look from a different angle, I see other metadata. Uh, this is a different kind of interaction than, again, that you do on, say, mobile or desktop. You know, here I'm using my body to control which facet of the information I'm looking at. Uh, a different design, uh, these sort of glowing figures represent other people who might be in the world with me. Uh, if you're doing this kind of design, I always implore you from the earliest, assume that you're gonna be doing multi-user, put the other people in there, see how they fit in the space, who's gonna be covering your interface, who are you gonna be getting uh, too close to, you know, uh, other kinds of interfaces, you know, do we wanna focus on one thing, how much space should these others get, you know, how small is the metadata now, can I actually resolve it, can I see it? Uh, what if we borrow from the real world? What if we did a virtual runway show? Again, these are just very quick ideas done over the course of a few days. And then here's the real thing that we made. Here's the real app. And it looks significantly different, which uh, to me is a good thing. And so what we're doing here is we, you'll notice there's actually much less information in this much lower density and it turned out because when we when we tested the other examples it was too hard for people to see things uh, so we we fill the space in a very different way sometimes less is more and also trying to figure out which things to, to vary it's kind of scary to see this now a few years on because it, it looks kind of frightening <laughs> what was that hmm? that was that <laughs> looking backwards yeah uh, but just to give you a feel for how things change over time, going from sketch, going through the, the 3D mock-ups, and then to, to the real app and how they evolve. I mentioned uh, Horizon Worlds, which is uh, the, the product I worked on before I joined Adobe. Again, the setup, uh, Horizon Worlds is a social VR app. Uh, if you want to think about like Minecraft, you can think like Minecraft. If you want to think about like Fortnite, you can. But essentially, it's a place where you go into VR, you're, you're around other people, 
not only can you be in various worlds, but you can actually build the worlds, which is cool. The, the entire world builder is in VR in the app itself. Uh, this is just a, a quick oh, promo video. Yeah. Sorry, so low resolution. Let's get this party started! Yeah. <laughs> Get some ice cream? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, I don't need to show more of the marketing video. But what I'm going to talk about, let me pause this for a second. What I want to talk about again is social interaction in these immersive systems. Uh, this is going to happen really quickly. I'll, I'll restart this clip. There's a lot going on here, so if you can, if you if you're able to hear well, try to listen, and then after it plays, I'll I'll say what's going on here, and then I'll talk about how you design around some of these these social issues. So let me. Play that again. Hey crew, how old are you? Can it start coming up? <laughs> hey crew, how old are you? I feel like he, he gives off like... <laughs> this kid's so weird. <laughs> crew, do you like eating? So there's a bunch of things that just happened there. Um, there's someone who is presenting as being a kid. Uh, everybody else in the space presents as being an adult, and the adults don't want that kid to be there. So this raises a lot of tricky questions. So what do you do? Well, you, could, uh, you know, the first thing people might naively say is, oh, we'll just have voice analysis, and we'll detect that they have a high-pitched voice. Kick them out. Uh, problem is some people have high-pitched voices, so you can't do that. We can do a height analysis because we know how high someone is based on their, their headset. Well, some people are shorter than other people, so you can't do that. Uh, maybe you could do behavioral analysis, like, oh, this person's moving around a lot, or they're doing, they're, they're basically stimming, you know, they're going around and around in circles. Well, there's problems with that because some people do those things who are, you know, neurodiverse. Uh, so you can't assign it necessarily to a certain characteristic. Oh, they could, you could ask them, are you a kid? Well, most kids don't want to say they're kids in something like this because they want to have the, the fun experience of everybody else. So it's very hard to do these sort of AI-based or automated systems to, to detect these behaviors. So what you did see in this is uh, someone in the world, m uh, myself, this is me, I actually went and just reported that person. But I don't know if you saw when the menu came up of things to report, being underage wasn't the, one of the reasons. So then, then I have this high cognitive load where all these stressful things are happening around me. Uh, you know, I want to prevent harm, but then I'm trying to go through this menu system and figure out what's happening. Also, this when I popped up this interface to find the person, you know, because I, I, they're moving around, so I can't select them. They're moving target. When I popped up this interface to select from, at that point, it's now covering the world, and I have no idea what's going on. Maybe this kid's picking up a virtual gun. Maybe they're making a, you know, a penis out of balls in in, in the VR world. Uh, so there is an issue at that point, uh, a tension between how do you give someone control over the world and how do you also make sure that they have awareness of what's happening in the world at the same time. So to, to deal with that, you know, it's design, essentially. So, you know, here's part of the design of a system we came, we came up with. Uh, and that was a very heavyweight interaction that you saw before where you have to report someone. It required me to open up an interface, it required me to find their name, it required me to put in all these reasons. So instead what we came up with what we could call a warning interface, which is a much lighter weight thing. Uh, you know, it, it's, not, it's not punitive, but we could actually keep track. So if someone gets a certain number of warnings, then there's certain signals to it. Uh, but there's a lot of different flows and branches and things you have to go through. Uh, and you know, it's one thing to design this in Figma, have it all lay out. But then that all kind of falls apart sometimes in your VR. Uh, let me show, what, show you what that looks like actually in VR when it was implemented. So this is a split screen. So right here, this is the, uh, I can't remember who's the good guy and who's the bad guy here. Uh, but we'll, we'll figure it out by watching it. But this is a, from two different people's point of view, seeing a warning being issued. And you think that's a pretty simple thing, uh, but there's actually some subtle subtleties here, not just the visual subtleties of where's the interface, what does it present, but also when I send someone a warning, should they know that I warn them? Should it be anonymous? Uh, if there's, because you, you worry about retribution in these kinds of systems as well. You know, on a, on a phone or if you're in Discord, not as big of a deal, but when you're embodied and people have a, a physicality and they can interfere with what you're doing in that space, which is a particularity of, of XR design, you have to be very careful with how information is passing from one person to another. So let's, let's roll through this. So 
I open up the menu and I say warn them. And if I want to, I can select the behavior, but I don't have to. And I send the warning. And then uh, over here, this person, it doesn't say who sent you the warning. It just says somebody, you know, has sent you a warning. And, uh, you know, and it gives a very vague threat. It doesn't say how many times. And that's reason because we want to leave uh, some ambiguity in the system uh, because different kinds of, there is a lot of contextual information as to why something might happen. And also people abuse these systems. So I'll roll through that again. So issue the warning. person is locked, like they can't do anything for a little while while they're up there, so there's a, a kind of cost to that warning popping up. So, uh, so in some sense, it's a simple action that happened, just sending a warning there, uh, but there were a lot of steps that were necessary to get there, and then there's a lot of consequences to what, to what happens and how that plays out in the world. Any questions about those examples I just showed? Uh, I do invite you all to, you can go, if you have access to a headset, do go into Horizon Worlds. It's a pretty fascinating uh, environment. Some of the, and I'm not shilling because, you know, I'm, I don't get paid by Meta anymore, but uh, when you go in there, you will see some pretty wacky things. Uh, there's a, something called Metacourt, where people have created a courtroom, and it's, it's all play acting or LARPing in some sense, and they act out different, different scenes. Uh, people have done a lot of recording studios, people have done spaces for different underrepresented groups, which is pretty awesome. People have done comedy clubs. Uh, you also see a lot of kids and a lot of misbehavior. Uh, I would say sometimes it's the best and the worst uh, all in one place. Uh, it's not quite as bad as what you might see in VR chat, and some of the reason is because there's, there's limited ability to make things that, physical things that are offensive, whereas in VR chat you can make anything uh, and anything does go there. Uh, so let me step step back and uh, what are some of the conclusions from this? What, what can we actually learn from some of these principles? Uh, first one is in, in these environments, these immersive environments, don't tease your user, okay? What that means is don't present in, uh, things that afford certain abilities but don't actually give them. So a classic example is you're in some environment and there's something that looks like a handle or a drawer and you, you, people want to go over, people want to touch and pull everything. If you're going to give them something that looks like it can do something, make sure it does it. It actually does that action, or give them a very good reason that it doesn't do that action. Uh, you know, often we add a lot of detail to our virtual worlds, not just uh, for visual pleasure, but also to help with wayfinding. Uh, but the tension there again is, if you add that visual detail, you're giving, you're you're buying into a metaphor that people start building a story around, and you want to you want to meet them uh, with those expectations. Uh, which is why sometimes abstraction can be very useful, as long as there's a lot of detail in the abstraction. Uh, legibility, super important. Uh, you saw that in some of the examples. Uh, you know, we often think about how can we pack things into space. Uh, you know, if you're doing things on mobile or desktop, we often think about how can I cram as much in there, or you know, I'm going to scroll through it. Uh, that becomes a very big problem in XR again because attention is so important, especially in social VR. If I'm scrolling all the time, I'm spending scrolling is time where things are happening in the world I might be missing something or something might be happening yeah. to me. Uh, so the, the real burden there up front is to think about legibility. Uh, I talk about attention. Uh, anticipate as much as you can where people are going to go into the world before they go. Some of this is like classic game design, you know, when you're doing level design. Uh, it gets harder in VR when you have freeform environments and you can't actually control where they go. If you start uh, making areas where they, they can't go or you put their body on rails and again you cause nausea. Uh, so you have to allow the freeform movement and uh, you have to be very introspective when you're creating these worlds of what might people do that you don't want them to do. Uh, also try to think about how people are going to use the space. Uh, and these are all photos I took, these are real world examples and then these are staged. Uh, People will use the space in ways that you don't intend. You know, in something like Horizon or other VR-based world builders, there's a lot of panels. People, people can put them in different places. 
And we often give you a lot of control over where you can put the panels, but the problem is when you give people a lot of control, then they can do things sort of the wrong way. They can put things in places where they lose them. They can lose those panels. They can uh, overlay them on top of each other. So there's information that you need uh, that you wouldn't be able to see. Uh, and again, I, I talked about modality. That's another reason we like to have modal interfaces in VR is because that way we're guaranteed you don't lose things. Uh, I talked about bounds and keeping people in certain places. There's good ways and, and bad ways to do that. Uh, the bad way is by making you only be able to move on certain paths like you might do in certain kinds of games. Can't do that in VR. Uh, better ways to do it are to give disincentives. So as you go towards certain regions, you know, you change visual cues or auditory cues to indicate that that's probably not a great place to go. You still let them go there, but you give them feedback to indicate uh, that they don't want to do it. Uh, some systems, I think of like Half-Life VR, uh, when you go past the world, because it's a very beautifully constructed world, but if you try to stick your head through a wall, then the world just blacks out, essentially. So that is a kind of disincentive to, to trying to do that. Uh, they don't prevent it, but they, they give you a very uh, fair way of showing you that that's probably not going to get you what you want to do. Uh, anybody recognize this location? <laughs> yeah. Uh, as, you know, as I showed, it's very easy to get lost. It's very easy to lose not just your own body, but to lose your panels, your interfaces, your controllers, other people. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been in social VR and people say, where are you, where are you, where are you? Uh, you know, in the real world, uh, you, we even do it in the real world. You know, you call someone, you say, where, where are you? Uh, happens in VR too, uh, but it's even more complicated because people can teleport. Uh, you know, here we have continuity in physics. So if I see you walk out that door, you know, I know you're probably not going to end up on that ferry in two seconds. Whereas in VR, you know, you might be in the space station in two seconds. So then the where are you becomes much more uh, important. Uh, so try to make sure people don't get into the bad situations ahead of time. So before they navigate, before they teleport, give them an idea of what the consequences of doing that are. So uh, I didn't show this example, but in a lot of social VR systems, when you when you're about to teleport, it'll, it'll pop up things that say, do you want to bring along your friends? Or do you want to send a notice to these people that you're moving? And again, that's a way of, of helping you understand the consequence of what your action might be before you do it. Not something that happens in, in mobile and desktop as far as I know. Uh, we also go through different trends in UI design. You know, sometimes we do skeuomorphism, sometimes we do you know, hyper abstraction, like you know, Windows 8 kind of stuff. Uh, you know, we find certain balances. This becomes a big problem in VR for, for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, the biggest is it's, it's really hard in VR sometimes to distinguish the UI from the actual content. Uh, we have, in some sense, we have limited channels. On a desktop or phone, there's a lot of things we can do to distinguish the UI. You know, we have parallax, we can make sure things are always on top, drop shadows, other kinds of stuff, different behaviors. But in VR, because a lot of things have to be in the world, they actually have to be world attached, it becomes really challenging to know what's object and what's interface. Uh, so if we just translate what we do on phone, you know, the, the love is abstraction, and then just pin things to the world, uh, it becomes really hard to know what's what and what to do with things. Uh, also think about, uh, you know, where are you spending your budget when you're communicating with your user? And budget doesn't just mean money, it means you know, back to legibility and how do you convey detail? When is the right time to convey detail? Uh, you know, I think about this real world example here. You know, they spent five cents on this light and then they spent, you know, maybe, you know, 50 cents or a dollar on this sign because the light is completely abstract and ambiguous as to what it is. Uh, this also happens in VR. If you have some cue and, you know, you want to make it abstract because you want to keep your scene really clean, you don't want to distract people, uh, but then you have to pop up something to explain what that is, you're probably not doing it the right way. Uh, so think about all the times when you have to explain things to people. So, uh, and another way to think about this is uh, when you're in XR, you're actually perceptually disabled in a lot of ways. Uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. One is you have the, the focus accommodation conflict, which is that even though you're seeing things stereoscopically, if you can, you're not actually focusing uh, based on that. In the real world, when something is farther away from me and closer, not only am I tilting my two eyes, I'm sort of going slightly cross-eyed uh, in and out, which we do in VR, but I'm actually changing the focus. I'm, I'm, I'm morphing the shape of my eyeball so that I'm changing the focus on something. 
In VR, we don't currently have the ability to do that, so you can get headaches uh, as things move around, so that's one level of, of uh, perceptual impairment. Another is I have less senses of the physical world, you know, people bump into things, uh, people are uncomfortable in them, uh, other kinds of reasons. So we need to assume that people are impaired, we need to give them more cues, more help than they have in the, in the normal world. Uh, you know, there's a trend right now in a lot of UI design, especially for, for kids and tweens and, and teens, uh, to not tell them how to do things. Uh, and, and that's fun, you know, if you go into something like Snap or Instagram or things like that, or TikTok, there's a lot of hidden UI. And that's a feature in those systems because kids like to pass lore back and forth. That's not a feature in VR. Uh, that's, that's actually a detriment uh, because again, people start alone uh, and they can't see each other's interfaces even when they are in the same place. So it's very hard to pass lore back and forth in the world. Uh, so you have to help them, you have to tell them. It feels kind of like you're in preschool and you're explaining things a lot of the time. Uh, and we feel as designers, we kind of have to dumb down what we do. Uh, but if you want your stuff to be successful, you, you got to do that. So with that, uh, thank you for letting me go way over. I'm going to just say thank you, everybody, uh, for listening. And I, again, apologize that we weren't in headset. Maybe <laughs> next year we can all do this in headset or in Apple Vision or something like that. So thank you. Thank and you. Any questions? Happy to take any questions, comments, feedback. I'm actually. What's your name? Uh, I'm Augustina. Hi, I'm Dan. Yeah, I'm actually very curious about like prototyping for VR. I heard that's a little bit different from uh, like the UI, actually like geographic UI interface on like the laptop. Um, and then you just talked about you use like Figma to do prototyping. Is there any specific tool? Uh, I think you mentioned like Unity. Uh, that's specific. Uh, use for a VR. Thank you. I'm going to repeat the question in case uh, mm -hmm. the recording can't yeah. hear. Uh, you were asking, so in traditional UI design, desktop mobile, we have very sophisticated tools for mocking things up, prototyping, even transitioning things to dev. We have Figma, XD. We used to have other tools to, to do that as well. And they're, they're pretty damn great, and they support real-time collaboration. In, in, uh, in the XR space, then we have a whole other set of kind of tools like Unity Unreal. I would say those are not design tools, they're not mock-up tools, they're, they're IDEs, they're implementation tools. Uh, there's a very, very small number of tools for doing mock-ups in, in XR. I would say maybe there's one right now or two. Uh, Shapes XR, uh, which is a great tool, there's a free tier, you know, it runs on headset. It lets you, think of it as like PowerPoint or Figma in VR, so you can put things in the space and you can go frame to frame, you can even do limited interaction. Uh, most of the examples that I showed up front that had the sort of blue avatar that was all done in Shapes XR. Uh, sometimes people use Gravity Sketch, which is sort of a, a conceptual design like a simplified CAD program in VR. People use that sometimes, but again, Shapes XR is, is probably the best for doing mock ups. And, you know, I'll say over and over again, Kevin will back me up on this. As soon as you get into an implementation tool like Unity or Unreal on, on the 3D side, or if you're in Visual Studio on the, the 2D side, whatever it is, you're not doing design anymore. And part of you should say, you know, what's going on here? You know, I'm implementing. And, and unless you have real good data that the thing you're making is actually what people want to use, you need to back yourself, you know, back yourself way up and get back into the design tools. So, uh, again, Shapes XR is where I'd point you. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Other questions? I'd love to know where VR um, is with folks with disabilities, like in terms of physical disabilities. Are, how is that working with so much of it's, you know, handheld and tactile and, you know, what does that look like? So uh, I'll give a nuanced answer. First answer is it's terrible. Uh, most of the design, and, and this is speaking from the inside, you yeah. know, because, you know, all companies like to say we have accessibility efforts and that we do accessibility audits and the things we do. Uh, but when you're on the inside, you'll see that a lot of the, the more immersive things get exceptions to all that. Uh, and, you know, there's all these justifications about time to market, blah, 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 who's using the thing. And, you know, and that just hurts me because I, I think of that as the, the curb cut phenomena or the ramp phenomena, which is, you know, for years and years people said, you know, we don't need curb cuts and we still hear you don't need ramps because we don't have anybody in wheelchairs using that building. And, of course, 
no one's using that building because you don't have a ramp. And, and, and also, also ended up yeah. helping more people than just those in wheelchairs. Right. And then also remember that we will all, every single one of you, uh, are going to be disabled at some point, either temporarily or eventually, Situation. permanently, uh, yeah. all of us. Uh, so, you know, preaching the choir here. So what's happening is terrible. It's not good. Um, I thought the some of the emphasis of the, the Apple Vision Pro was pretty interesting because they did not rely on controllers. They did a lot of hand tracking. Uh, also, a lot of what they were showing were people sitting down. They were not walking around through the space. So they're sort of giving a nod to uh, being able to support a, a, uh, a more passive experience to, to some degree. Uh, there has been a lot of work on voice input. Uh, it works okay sometimes. Uh, if you're in social VR, it's a little weird because you know I'm trying to talk to someone and then I'm saying, "Hey Siri," essentially, uh, and you know where is that that going? Uh, but the, so the first answer is it's bad. Second answer is there's been some feeble attempts at making it better. Um, I've had inbounds from various grad students who reach out to me and say, "You know what's the state of the art in in accessibility for VR?" And to which I say. There isn't. Why don't you go invent it? <laughs> so, so I offer that as sort of back to, as a challenge to the group. Other questions, Andy? Uh, one of the things you mentioned uh, was the difficulty in inputting text and with the drumsticks. And I noticed in, with the Apple, they're using eye tracking for that. And I'm wondering when you saw the Apple promo, were there other things that you saw as challenges that you discussed here? that you find their approach to be something that's like promising. So the, the, the eye tracking one is interesting because I've done a fair amount of work in eye tracking or, or both sort of for some personal reasons and then also professional stuff. And up until this point, the state of the art's been from a Swedish company named Toby. Uh, their stuff's integrated into a lot of other devices. And you know, when you first start doing eye tracking, you think, well, what I do is I'll just look at something and then I'll dwell. You know, I'll just keep looking at it and that'll do the selection. Turns out that actually doesn't work with the way the eye works. We have saccades, our eyes are always moving, and it's really hard to, to judge intentionality from unintentional motion. Uh, and, it's a very, and it's also very exhausting to just dwell on something. So the, the recommended uh, best practice, at least until very recently from, from Toby and companies like that, was to, you know, to move your eye into something and then have a secondary button that said select. What Apple did, which was very interesting, and this is only possible now with new techniques in machine learning, uh, is to apply predictive technology to that. So I assume what they did, you know, they don't disclose, I assume they did a ton of training on a lot of people uh, where they probably had, you know, a Toby eye tracker and they probably had a button and they did give them lots of t time on target testing. And then they used that to track saying, you know, when people are doing these kinds of saccades, it probably, you know, statistically, probabilistically means that they want to select this thing. So what's happening with the Apple system, we think, we surmise, is that even as you're moving towards something, they're making predictions that of where you're going to end up, and they sort of prime the system to say that's probably what you're going to select, so that you don't need a secondary selection. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. So that's a long-winded answer of saying that's actually new stuff with the, that they're, that they're doing. Um, there weren't other things they were doing that were particularly novel, but that was one of the, the standouts uh, in terms of interaction to, to get rid of that secondary selection. The other thing I saw that looked really interesting was, to the best of my knowledge, everyone else has a hard split between are you VR or AR? And that their system, you can dial in how much do you want to be, you're on a flight and you want to dial out the world, or you're in an environment where you're working with other people in the physical space. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think a lot of that was a very good marketing because, you know, certainly on a quest today, I mean, right now it's, it's, it's a, not an explicit action, it's an implicit. So if I'm VR, but then I go past the virtual bounds that I've described, then the real world comes in, it sort of leaks in. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's in response to a, a physical movement through the world as opposed to me turning a dial. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's good marketing. I don't know how much people will actually do that. Um, that. That's my response there. They're very good storytellers. Yes. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Alice. Hi. Um, so my question is, at the beginning of your presentation, you showed maybe your coworker with a desk full of things, and she has a few monitors and then a notepad and blueprint on paper. So it seems to me that uh, one, at least one of the uh, solution that AR or VR gives is I can manage my space on one piece of device and uh, with uh, multiple kinds of media instead of having like a notebook and 
Um, so I'm trying to think um, at what point will we be like hooked to this device where right now if I have a piece of paper and pen, I know I'm, if I need to write a note, I'll just grab and write it. If I just send an email, I'll grab my phone or have like a, if I have a computer handy, I'll do it on a computer. At what point do you think, uh, or are we even getting there? Um, at some point, I know, okay, I have to do something to do, and I'm going to do it in VR. Um, so, fun like that. So, so let me try to repeat back your question. So I, I think what you're asking is, what are the thresholds, what are the barriers to using one device to, to do multiple kinds of, of input uh, across diverse tasks? Is that sort of what you're, you're getting at? Yes, and also at what point... Uh, it will be like wired to our minds that uh, I would do something. Do you mean literally plugged in? Yeah. You mean like the matrix? <laughs> tap? I mean, because. <laughs> like, um, when I want to do a task and I know I have to do it in VR, it's the first thing that comes up in terms of. Oh, okay. I think yeah. so. So uh, I'm going to give you a very long answer to your, your short question because uh, I love anecdotes. And this one comes from the, the chief economist at Microsoft who I had the pleasure of working with sh shortly. And we were. We were uh, prognosticating some future developments and we were talking about resource allocation in the physical world. And we were talking about uh, resources in the neighborhood. And we were doing some brainstorming. I said, you know, why don't we do an app for sharing things like lawnmowers? Like, why does every house have to have its own lawnmower? Mm -hmm. You know, I use it once a week, once every two weeks. You know, I could have an app and it says, oh, it's at Joe's garage. And I hit a code and the garage opens and then I've got the lawnmower. And, uh, great. And he said, ah, oh, interesting idea. And he said, the barrier to doing any new thing like that is not the technology and it's, it's not you know, how it presents this. It's not the security, whether you can get the garage or not. It's convenience. So he said that, that lawnmower thing, the, research, the reason everybody has their own lawnmower is because it's convenient. It's right there. Uh, I know no one else is gonna break it. Uh, you know, I know how it works. I don't have to learn somebody else's thing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different reasons. So, that, that lens of convenience, even though I don't like it, it kind of hurts my soul, I apply to the same question you have. So I think about my house where my wife writes on post-it notes and then put and then forgets them and, leave, and note and pieces of paper and puts them all over the place, not as reminders to anybody else, and not even for recall. She's writing on them just to, to get, you know, the act of writing is a, is a way of remembering in itself. And for her, the reason she's doing it on, on paper or whatever is on hand is convenience because it's right there. Uh, it doesn't require a cognitive load. She doesn't have to decide, you know, where am I going to put this file? Which app am I going to open? Uh, how am I going to color code this or anything else? It's just, I need to write this down. What's the quickest thing I can write on? You know, maybe it's her hand, maybe it's a piece of paper. So until this magical AR, VR thing becomes as convenient as grabbing anything at hand, then I'm, I'm very skeptical. Uh, unless there's some huge, huge win. So, so convenience is, is part of the answer. Uh, you, you said another word, which is really good, which is uh, when will you use the, when will it be the first thing you think of doing that? Uh, and so another way of, of casting that is when does it become indispensable? Uh, and we sometimes call that the toothpaste thing, you know, or the toothbrush thing, like toothbrush being you know, indispensable. Uh, and you can think of the phone has now become that way. I can't tell you how many times the, the kids, will, or my kids will leave the house, maybe they forget their lunch, but they have never forgotten their phone. Uh, so that, that phone has become indispensable in, in, in some sense. Or, uh, so how will we get to that point? Uh, I don't have a good answer, but I think that that lens of, uh, maybe one lens is anxiety. Do you feel anxiety about not having the thing? Not yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, I have these devices at home and the kids never use them, so we're certainly never, we're not there yet. <laughs> Uh, but so it's not a direct answer, but I would say is is at least a lens to approach is think about convenience and think about indispensable as, as the the ways to approach it. Andy. So there's sort of a follow on to that, and I, I was thinking in the context of I'm old enough to remember when personal computers came out, and Lotus One Two Three was the killer app, and it really helped launch the personal computer revolution back in the '80s, and. Um, Things like, you could say Google Maps or other things really pushed the phone, everyone had a new phone. Email was it for RIM, for the Blackberry. Um, right now, most of us see VR and AR as for games. And we see very little utility for 
VR and AR, unless you count games. And the games aren't good enough to be considered the killer app. Mm -hmm. As you said, your kids don't even use them. What do you see looking forward as killer app that's going to make people say, okay, now I want to buy VR? Uh, and it's not just going to be the price comes down. It's got to be yeah. the utility goes up. And where do you see that coming? So I thought I thought there were some hints maybe in the Apple presentation. You know, uh, and it definitely bordered on the creepy, but they showed a lot of stuff around memory. Um, I don't know if you remember that yeah, clip where it's very uh, you know, creepy. Yeah, the creepy was how it was captured. That uh, just in case you didn't see it, the uh, yeah. white dude is at this kid's birthday party. He's wearing a headset instead of actually being there, being <laughs> present. Uh, so that part seems creepy. The other part where you can re-experience things, that can become magical. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, you know, the way they showed it was also very sad. You know, a guy seemed like he was alone in the hotel room watching a life that he didn't have anymore. Um, but I think there is some magic about re-experiencing things. And I have small signals, anecdotal again. You know, when I do bring people into VR, you know, one of the first apps I, I used to show them was, was Google Earth uh, in VR, where you can go anywhere. What do people do when they get in there? The first thing they do, do they go off and see Mount Everest? Do they go to the Arctic Triumph? No, they go find their own home. Um, and maybe the home they grew up in. First they go to the home they live in now, but then they, they try to find the home they grew up in. There is a magic about re-experiencing something. Mm -hmm. If we can get the capture so it's not creepy, you know, uh, and then I can get back to it in a way that isn't sad, uh, I think that that will, will have a lot of promise. That maybe that would be the, the killer app. I don't necessarily think it's gonna be on your head though. It may be more in the environment somewhat. Uh, the, the counter narrative to that though is, and again, this is all anecdotal and adjacency, is I think about music. So first thing I bought when I got my first real job was what I thought was crazy at the time was a thousand dollar stereo. You know, big speakers, all that, loved it. What do my kids do now? You know, they listen to music off of a phone and it, it hurts me because the, the audio is so bad. So, but the, the lesson from that is, so, you know, so we talked about the threshold of convenience, threshold of indispensability. Another threshold is what is good enough. So for my kids, listening to music on the phone is good enough. So maybe looking at a, a, a photo, whether it be on a phone or a Polaroid, will always be good enough, and I don't need to actually be in it. So, so I, can, I can give you either side of that story. What is good enough? Uh, but back to what will the killer apps be? Certainly an enterprise. You know, if there's something that's around life safety, training, uh, I think that's gonna be some killer app stuff. It's not good enough yet to get there. Um, there's a company, Axon, a problematic company. They, they're the company that does tasers and body cams. Um, I don't know if you know, but they're, they have a huge VR effort, all centered in Seattle, mostly, uh, former coworkers of mine. And what they're doing is they're training, they're trying to train law officers to de-escalate uh, in violent situations and potentially violent situations. You know, their motto, whether they mean it or not, is, you know, that no one ever fires a gun. Um, and so they are trying to help in, or at least their advertising is trying to help with mental health issues. You know, if you encounter something, how do you train someone? I see potential there. Um, I do question who is making these things. Uh, you know, what's the color of the skin of the people making these things? Who are the people making the business decisions? That's really important. Are people from the community actually involved in that? But that could be, I hate to use this term, but that could be a killer app if you, if you actually uh, help people <laughs> learn how to get along with other people. Um, military will still continue, continue to spend crazy in this area. I think the military will buy a lot of these Apple headsets. You know, right now they're buying $13,000 Varro headsets from Finland, and uh, if you can get one of these $4,000 headsets, that's, you know, that's a few more $1,000 toilet seats you can buy. So. It's only $35.99. Yeah. <laughs>